You also have four chapters on sexual violence and misconduct. What are some of the most important things you want young people to know about sexual consent? Well, you know, so there are 11 chapters in the book. And as you said, there's four in the sexual violence and misconduct section. And in only one chapter of the entire book do I say, reader, this is the most important chapter of the book. And that chapter, Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of Make Today Well Live, the podcast. I'm Ali Norman Franks. I'm Beverly Hills High School Wellness Counselor, and hosting with us today are two of our peer counselors, Nick Kay and Kate Lewis. This month is our Digital Safety Month, so we have as a guest a digital safety expert, Jonathan Crystal, who actually attended El Rodeo and Beverly Hills High School, and at that time, he got himself into a lot of trouble. Now, he's a veteran prosecutor for the city of Los Angeles. He went from disregarding the laws to enforcing them. Jonathan is a certified sexual violence prevention instructor, and he is the author of What They Don't Teach Teens. Hi, my name is Kate Lewis. I am a junior and peer counselor at Beverly Hills High. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me and Nick here this morning. And I want to start off by asking, why did you write the book, What They Don't Teach Teens? And out of all the topics that you cover, which one is the most urgent or critical for teens to understand? Yeah, well, those are, are great questions, particularly what's the most urgent. But uh, let me give you some background. So uh, about five years ago, I'm literally sitting on the sofa with my wife of 20 years watching TV, and she urges me to teach our three sons about sexual consent. And of course, I said, uh, we need to, absolutely. But it got me thinking that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, things we have got to teach young people as parents, teachers, caregivers, uh, who are coming of age today, um, these young people have to know more than just about sexual consent, you know, their rights with the police, uh, what acts can amount to sexual harassment, the digital footprint, cyberbullying, so many issues that they're probably not going to learn in school. So I, I started researching for a book that I was looking for. I found nothing. And uh, my wife urged me to write the book. And I did. And as a little bit of background, I have uh, a lot of training in sexual violence prevention. I am a career prosecutor uh, to this very day. Um, and uh, I was a troubled teen when I was uh, going to school at El Rodeo and Beverly High, but I'm sure we'll talk about that a little more. Um, as far as, you know, some of the most uh, important topics in the book, that's, you know, that's a, that's a tough one. And I guess that's really the beauty of the book because the book is divided into three sections. Uh, one on safer police interactions and street safety, another on sexual violence and misconduct, and the third section on uh, digital safety. And so it's really up to the reader to, you know, pick and choose through the book what is most important to them at that given time, because it can change from day to day, week to week, month to month. That's so interesting, your story on how you got started with your wife and showing teens how they can live a safe life. And what were the hot issues that teens dealt with at El Rodeo and at Beverly Hills High when you were a student? And was there any support for you guys? Well, you know, um, we didn't deal with issues, you know, and I can only really speak from my experience and the experience uh, of my peers and what I saw going around me. Um, but really, we weren't particularly aware of what was going on in society. We weren't particularly aware of social issues, social justice issues. Um, in many ways, we were, you know, living in our little bubble and um, not really connected in, in any meaningful way to the struggles of what, you know, many people were going through, which doesn't mean that we didn't, you know, have our own struggles, but um, we were very insulated. And, um, you know, we didn't have the appreciation. I think, you know, young people coming of age today, you all are pretty smart and savvy and understand what's going on around you in the city, in your state, in the nation, and even in the world in a way that, that my generation never was. But of course, um, you know, teens are prone to make mistakes. 
And mistakes made today can simply, in some situations, have greater consequences, particularly in the digital world in which we live and you all are growing up in. Yeah, I mean, as you're saying, like, now it's so much more different for teens going through this experience now that we have social media and smartphones. And in particular, why do you have an entire chapter on smartphone cameras? One of the most interesting stories that you include is you relay some stories about two 16-year-olds who were prosecuted for having moods of each other. Can you go more in depth about that? Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting because when I started outlining the book, I, this was a five-year process. Um, obviously, you know, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a husband, father to three sons and a full-time professional. So, you know, writing the book uh, was done in my off hours and, and it took a, a fair amount of time. Um, but I initially, I didn't plan on having the, the chapter on smartphone cameras. But when, it, when I got to the digital safety aspects as I was writing, researching, interviewing, it became pretty apparent to me that some of the most significant struggles I saw young people going through, uh, maybe they had you know, taken a misstep or they had been victimized by somebody else. And um, it somehow connected to cameras, uh, whether it was an image they shouldn't, maybe it was inadvisable to share or someone took an image of them or hacked into a camera or a laptop. It just, it seemed like it had to be discussed. So in that camera, you know, I talk about, you know, Self, good selfies, bad selfies, dangerous selfies, safe selfies, selfies that can mess up your digital footprint, and, and a lot of other things um, related to cameras. But referring to uh, nudes and, and underage sexting is, is a fair, you know, component, a, a fair, fairly sized component of that chapter. Because again, I saw a, a lot of young people, um, we all know a lot of young people share nudes. And but what a lot of young people don't realize is that if you're a minor, and you share that nude or even possess that nude, even of yourself, it's a serious crime um, related to child pornography, um, but, but more accurately described as, as child sexual abuse material. And you know, some people think that's absurd and how could that be? Um, and they're right, uh, it's a misapplication of the law. So there's child pornography laws that were put on the books to protect children, but in some instances they're being used to prosecute children. And one of the, the, throughout the book, I talk about real stories, actually, you know, things that happened related to the chapter topic to teens in the US. And one of the stories, and I could have chosen many, but one was um, these uh, two young people, an intimate couple in North Carolina. And in North Carolina, the age of sexual consent is 16 years old. It's 18 in California, 16 in North Carolina. Um, but, uh, what happened with these young people, they were lawfully allowed to be in this intimate relationship in high school uh, where, they were, where, where they were going, but there was a police or a school investigation and their phones were searched just as part of a random search of a bunch of people and nudes of each other were found. Well, both of those young people were arrested, they were, they were prosecuted, faced serious consequences. And what was so crazy about this situation is that it was, they were lawfully allowed to have sex, but weren't allowed by law to have a nude image of each other on their devices. So again, it's a misapplication of the law, but the law just hasn't kept up with technology. That's really interesting to hear about how the laws are being not applied correctly to teens these days. I think it is just a new struggle that teens are having to go through. And thank you so much for joining me and Nick on this uh, podcast. Those are all the questions from me and I'm gonna hand it over to Nick now. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Nick Kay. I'm a senior at Beverly. And um, can you just explain to us first what sextortion is? Yeah, hey Nick. So chapter, I think it's six, um, is dedicated entirely to sextortion. And what was, you know, one of the most troubling things, you know, obviously there's a lot of unsettling material in the book, um, but once you get a handle on it, it, it becomes actually reassuring that you know how to handle things um, should the unexpected come about. But I, but like the, the digital cameras, I didn't initially plan on uh, having a chapter on sextortion, which is online sexual blackmail. And as I just, again, researching, writing, interviewing, it became clear to me that nobody, almost nobody is talking about sextortion 
And yet it is the biggest, according to the Department of Justice, it is the biggest growing online threat against minors in, in the world, or at least in our country, but I would say probably the world. Um, so essentially it's online sexual blackmail. And there's a number of different ways sex extortion happens. I'll give you a couple of, of examples. So probably the most common way a uh, sex extortion situation arises is there's an intimate couple. Uh, let's say that they're teenagers because the average age of a sex extortion victim is 15 years of age. And they exchange me. So, and <clears throat> one of them wants to break up. So the, the other partner says, look, if you break up with me, uh, I'm gonna take that nude you, you sent me and I'm gonna share it to everybody you know, your parents, I'm gonna tag your family, your friends and so on. Or if you don't come back to our relationship after, after breaking up with me, cause you've already broken up, I'm gonna do the same thing. And, um, and then there's many other different ways people are sextorted. Uh, hackers get into, let's say the, the, the laptop or the desktop, desktop camera in their bedroom and capture an image um, that way and then send an email to them or a text saying, hey, if you don't pay me money, meet me for sex, send me more images and the list goes on, I'm gonna release your new to everyone you know. So it's a serious crime and, and really it's a crime of unspeakable brutality. And again, it disproportionately impacts young people, but for whatever reason, it's just not talked about enough um, and there are a lot of ways we can protect ourselves from sextortion, but you know, whether or not we protect ourselves, it's never the victim's fault for uh, you know, the perpetration of a, you know, a terrible act on them by someone in many cases they probably trusted. Yeah, it's, it can get very, very scary, especially when it's someone like a hacker or something like that. And kids just don't think about it and yeah. the, the risk to it. Um, can you describe what it means to be situationally aware? Um, you yeah. describe a chapter on street safety. Yeah, you know, um, again, there's there, yeah, there's an entire chapter on street safety, well, you know, and, and I really wrote that because, um, you know, I get it, you know, so many young people, um, and, and this isn't true for all young people. There are, there are young people certainly growing up in certain neighborhoods where they have to be situationally where they have got to keep their head on a swivel or they may not make it home for the day. And, and so those f folks, they don't need the chapter because they're already living it and they've already uh, uh, understand it. But for at least so many other young people, you know, we've got our heads or they've got their heads buried in their phone and as many adults do. Um, and maybe they're growing up in a neighborhood where they don't uh, feel like they need to always be situationally aware, but they're going to move on from those neighborhoods. They're going to maybe travel the world, go to different places. And, you know, having um, so an understanding of how to keep ourselves physically safe is incredibly important. And the number one way to do that is to be situationally aware. And what that means is to you know, keep your wits about you as you go about your daily life. And you rely on your eyes and your ears and your intuition to do so. And, uh, and you know, it's also described as keeping your head on a swivel. And that doesn't mean you're constantly looking around. It, it simply means when you're standing on the sidewalk, you periodically get your head out of your phone, take out one of your earbuds or AirPods and look around. And again, this is not just for young people, but young people can be disproportionately targeted with physical violence and, and street crime. So it is particularly important for them. And some people say situational awareness who don't understand it, say that it's, you know, it's about being paranoid, but it's not whatsoever. It's about um, essentially knowing that it's very, very unlikely anything's going to happen to you, but things happen and no victim in the history of victimhood ever thought they'd become a victim. And one of the most important ways to stay situationally aware, as I relay in the book, is, is pretty simple stuff. You know, when you walk into a restaurant, a, a bar one day for older uh, or for younger adults who are of age, um, a, a new school, a hotel, find one emergency exit, just one. And what, you know, I've seen from, my, again, the writing, read it, reading, interviewing, researching, um, is that it can be really, really hard when there's mass panic from a natural disaster or a man-made disaster to find the emergency exit, but it's really easy to find when you walk in. It takes two seconds. And that's what I tell my own boys. Um, look, guys, you know, 
don't walk around with your head in your phone. Take one of your, your, your earphones out. But, you know, when you walk into a new place, know where one emergency exit is, because that can really help you in a, if the need arises. It's, it's very smart to remind kids to take their heads out of their phones when they're walking. I mean, I catch myself sometimes staring for too long at my phone and I'm like, where, where am I? I don't know where I walk yeah. to. <laughs> we all do that sometimes. <laughs> exactly. We all do that. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 it's one of those things where the more you practice situational awareness, it becomes second nature. Um, you know, when I go into, I told my boys, again, no, none of these, it's very unlikely any of these things are going to happen to us, but they are going to happen to someone. And what I say to my boys, look, you know, when you walk into a restaurant, I hope you notice an emergency exit, but keep in mind that in most restaurants, there's an exit through the kitchen. Most people don't know that. Um, but if all else fails and something bad's happening in, in a restaurant, there's probably going to be an exit through the kitchen. You included a story about a 15 year old who fought off an attacker. Um, what happened? Yeah, so, so there are countless stories like that. And, that. and in the chapter, that relates to one of the sections where I talk about street robberies for your stuff or street robberies for you. Uh, of course, God forbid any of these things would happen to, to anyone. Um, so in the beginning of that chapter, you know, I discuss and I interview law enforcement folks about, you know, what to do if someone wants to take your iPhone, your wallet, your purse, whatever it is. And, and the consensus, more, more detail in the book, but the consensus is, um, you know, those items are replaceable, you aren't, um, and you should never fight an attacker for a material item. And, you know, I teach uh, all the uh, material in my book to, to young people in person, and of course, these days via Zoom. And I always ask for a show of hands, how many of you, you're walking down the street and someone grabs your iPhone and takes off running, how many of you would give chase? And I'd say about 40 to 50% of the hands go up. And I tell them wrong answer, you know. Uh, what many people don't realize is even if you just see the guy or the person who took your phone, um, they probably have an accomplice that you can't see and they're, they're you know, hiding. So you're going you're gonna to put yourself in a really dangerous situation if you give chase. And then we transition in that chapter to, okay, they don't want to, the bad guy doesn't want to take your stuff. The bad guy wants to take you. What do you do? Because these are terrifying situations and situations understandably that are unsettling and that we typically don't think about. But in the event, one of these things happens, now that time is not the ideal time to be thinking about it and coming up with a plan of action. You want to come up with a plan of action in advance. So in a scenario like that, the perpetrator is probably going to say, you know, you know, put a gun or a knife to you and say, you know, get in my car or I'll kill you or don't scream and you won't get hurt. And every law enforcement uh, officer or agent I spoke to, everyone I've spoken to uh, who, who deals in private security or personal security with accomplishments in the field. Uh, books I've read, they all say the same thing. You fight it out at the, at the point of contact. You never go um, and you do whatever you have to, have to do. Scream, claw, kick, scratch, um, make a scene and you don't go ever. Because if you go, um, what experts describe it as, there will only be a second crime scene, the crime scene where you were abducted and a secondary crime scene where whatever that perpetrator wanted to do, which, which they couldn't do to you at the point of contact, they were able to do that second crime scene. So going to that story, and again, there were so many stories of young, brave people who fought back. Um, I forget the girl's name, but I, I, I don't, for most of the stories, I don't use the, 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 the real names in case, but I, I do when people have come out and shared their story. But so um, she was uh, walking home from school one day, she rounded a corner and there was a man standing by his car waiting for her. He grabbed her and he threw her in the car and was trying to, you know, uh, abduct her and drive away. Well, she just put up one heck of a fight and uh, fought back every single way she could, so much so um, squirming, fighting, scratching, screaming. And that at one point she was trying to get out of the car and all he could do at that point was reach for her boot and he pulled it off and she took off running. And, and um, I, I can only imagine what she was going through in that, in that situation. And I can only imagine what she's been going through ever since um, with the, tr the trauma of going through something like that. But it, it's 
fair to say that that had she not fought back, the situation could have been imminently worse. You also have a few chapters on uh, police interactions. Can you uh, elaborate a little more on those? Oh, sure. Um, so there's two chapters on police interactions. Uh, there's the first chapter on knowing your rights under the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. And what that means is, you know, do you have to answer the police questions? Are they allowed to search your stuff? Can they go in your home and your car and so on and so forth? And the second police chapter is on safer police interactions. And that means, you know, what do you do and not do when you get pulled over when you're driving or on foot? And I like to point out that the second chapter is called safer police interactions, not safe police interactions, because we certainly know that there are some situations that no matter what you do for people, particularly for people of color, um, that it can't be safe, that they've done nothing wrong and they are mistreated, uh, they're physically harmed and sometimes killed. So I make very clear in both chapters that, you know, knowing your rights and how to have a safer police interaction is no guarantee that things will go as they should, but it certainly can keep us safer uh, in many situations. And if things don't go as they're supposed to, um, it allows us to better hold the police accountable after the fact. And so when it comes to uh, your rights, you know, these are very personal decisions, you know, should you answer a question? Some, some people wanna answer the questions of the police, they've done nothing wrong and whether or not they have to, they will. Others don't wanna answer the questions of the police because one, they may not be, in many instances, they're not legally obligated to, and they're afraid that they're gonna uh, be mistreated. They're gonna, uh, you know, the, the police are gonna allege that they did something they didn't do and so on and so forth. And so, you know, I can tell you what I, I, I share, I've shared with my own sons and it's very personal. Um, people feel differently about it, uh, essentially, and again, People have their own opinions, but my opinion is to my sons, you know, if you've done nothing wrong, talk to the police, but the moment you think they suspect you've done something wrong, don't say another word. Now, and I give language in the book of, of you know, suggestions for uh, how you should assert your rights in a way that's respectful and, and maybe hopefully won't trigger um, anger by the police, of course, but there's no guarantee. But it's not easy to do, um, but you know, People are entitled to do it. Young people have the same rights as, as adults. And what's interesting about the police chapters is as a prosecutor, I work every single day I'm on the job with the police. I have very close relationships with many different people in law enforcement. And I, I am gratefully, uh, I'm grateful and respectful for what they do, but I'm also very clear and I make it again, very clear in the book that criminal justice reform is desperately needed. Um, things have to change, not just with policing, but the courts and prosecutors. There's much, much change that's needed. But going back to the material, uh, before um, I released the book, I, I gave some sample chapters on uh, your rights to police officers that I'm friends with. And I said, look, I'm giving away the story here. I am telling people the tricks of the trade. I am telling you how, I'm telling folks how you guys make arrests based on what people say when they don't have to say it necessarily. And I go, how do you feel about this? Are you mad at me? Because I got to work with you for the next however many years. And every single one who uh, is, is a parent or was a parent to teenagers said the exact same thing. Jonathan, what do you think I taught my own son or daughter? And that really resonated with me that, you know, if prosecutors are teaching our children this, police officers and many others, it's something uh, all young people ought to know. Um, so, you know, I, I know I, I, I kind of dance around that question, but um, I would say learn your rights under the Fourth and Fifth Amendment, uh, when the police are allowed to search your stuff, when they're not. And also, you know, when you get pulled over in particular, don't start reaching for anything until you're asked to do so. If it's at nighttime, uh, put on your dome light, Always put your hands on the steering wheel so the officer sees that you're not reaching for anything. And no matter how you feel about the police, you may hate the police, okay, but always be respectful of the, of the police. One, I think because they deserve your respect, but some people don't feel that way, I get that. But it is still in, in your best interest to be respectful of the police because you know, particularly as parents, we want you getting home safely, period. Full stop there. And, uh, and, you know, being disrespectful to the police shouldn't impact your ability to get home safely, but we all see that it can. We see it all in the news all the time. 
I think it's amazing that you added um, all of our rights into this, these two chapters, because a lot of us don't know, you know, exactly what the fourth and fifth amendments say we have the right to do in those situations. And personally with me, I didn't know before, you know, more recent events that have been happening in, um, in our society, it, it's important to know, even if you don't ever think you'll need it, yep. you, you should learn it. Right. Um, and, and, and I'm sorry, let me just jump in uh, and add on to that. Absolutely. And look, you may or may not need it, um, but you may be with a friend who needs it. You know, you may do nothing to, to bring the police to your door, but your friend might. And somebody ought to know their rights in, in that group. I mean, one person. So, yeah, I, I, I feel you. You also have four chapters on sexual violence and misconduct. What are some of the most important things you want young people to know about sexual consent? Well, you know, so there are 11 chapters in the book. And as you said, there's four in the sexual violence and misconduct section. And in only one chapter of the entire book, do I say, reader, this is the most important chapter of the book. And that chapter is on sexual consent. I say that because look, it's really important to know your rights and really important to, to understand your digital footprint and, and many, many other things. But, you know, almost all readers will have a sexual interaction or many sexual interactions over the course of their lifetime. So it's something that really um, applies to most everyone and is very relevant. Now, when I was uh, at Beverly and El Rodeo, you know, my mom taught me no means no for you know, sexual consent. That was the standard when I was growing up and I'm 49. And, you know, we now know that there are many, many reasons why someone may not utter the words no, but certainly doesn't want the sexual activity. So that, so that standard is woefully out of date. Affirmative consent, yes means yes. You don't proceed until you get a, a Full, uh, fully enthusiastic yes is the standard today as it should be. But having taught so much uh, related to sexual incent to young people and their parents, I see the same thing over and over. The question I keep getting is about alcohol and sexual consent. And that is a point of confusion for many people. And I really understand and I spend uh, pages in that chapter, just talking about alcohol because I hear about it so much. So I wish there was like a hard and fast rule that uh, I could you know, tell everyone, um, here's the bright line rule. Um, but you know, it can be confusing because for adults who are legally allowed to consume alcohol, you can have a, a, a consensual interact, sexual interaction after some amount of consumption of alcohol. And so we see that and we know that. Now, when it comes to, to folks that are underage and, um, and their alcohol and their new drinkers, it can be you know, even more confusing. So the first piece of advice I give is one, I know it may be easier said than done, but if you or someone you want to hook up with has had any alcohol, when I say alcohol, I, I mean any intoxicating substance, even if we're just talking about alcohol, um, don't hook up, save it for another sober day. Um, it is in your best interest. It is in the prospective partner's best interest. You have no hookups when there's any alcohol whatsoever involved. Now, like I said, that's ideal, but in many situations, I fully understand it's not realistic. I, I mean, you know, I, I, was, I was a teenager. I don't think it was that long ago, but where you all may disagree. Um, and so the, the, the next piece of advice I give, and again, I, I'm paraphrasing here, there's a lot more in the book. Um, I, I say, look, we all know when, when our friend would be too drunk to drive, right? Not, not, you can't always tell, but you can tell a heck of a lot of the time they're slurring, they're stumbling, they're acting out of character, maybe they're overly emotional, maybe they're combative, throwing up, passing out, whatever it is. Um, these are signs of someone being intoxicated and sometimes highly intoxicated. Now, if your friend were like that and said, uh, you know, hey, Nick, hey, Kate, uh, I'm about to drive home, you'd say, no way, you know, I'm taking your keys, you got an Uber, I'm going to get you home safely. 
And it's no different than uh, a, a sexual interaction with someone who's highly intoxicated. If they're too drunk to drive, they are too drunk to hook up with. You, they cannot give you consent. And that's what uh, many people don't realize. A drunken yes is not a yes at all. Uh, it, it's, it's a yes, they don't have the uh, ability to give by law. But this isn't just about laws. This is this is about, of course, what's doing uh, doing what's right. And so, if someone's too dry, too drunk to drive, they're too drunk to hook up. If you're too drunk to drive, you're too drunk to hook up. And really, it, it's about respect, um, and it's about you know treating people the way we want to be treated, and uh, making sure that that all of our sexual interactions are enthusiastic, are sober and are, are mutual uh, as far as the interest goes and uh, consent can always be withdrawn. And that's the last thing I'll, 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 I'll uh, say on this without any further questions from you. Um, it's not just young people who have uh, questions about this, it's adults too. Like I said, I teach this, this subject to parents and I always like to point out that, you know, someone uh, can revoke their consent even when they're naked. Even when both people are naked, um, re, re, uh, consent can always be revoked. And I will say there have been a number of situations where adults haven't completely understood that. I think you guys, you, you, teenagers, really, I, I hope they always abide by that, but I think they generally understand it. But, you know, um, parents, you know, we grew up at a different time and sometimes those messages uh, and those uh, myths and mistakes are still with us. So consent can always be withdrawn. Thank you so much. Consent is something that everyone has to learn and should know, you know, always. Um, we are coming to the end of our interview. Is there anything else you would like people and students and everyone watching this to know about your book? You know, I, I would say um, not just about my book, but one of the things I talk about uh, in the book is, you know, um, for young people to, to finding someone to talk to if, they, if they're ever in need. And, you know, as a troubled teen, you know, I had a lot of struggles growing up and, and you know, Beverly High didn't have Norman Aid when I was there. I um, mean, you know, I really could have used it. I needed somebody to talk to. I didn't feel like I could talk to my parents. So um, I, I urge young people in the book, you know, if you're suffering, don't, su please don't suffer in silence. Don't suffer alone. There's, there are people who want to help. Hopefully it's your, your parent, but not, not for everybody. Maybe it's a family friend, um, a coach, uh, a counselor, Norman aid. Don't suffer alone. There's people who will have your back. Um, and, you know, it's hard for things to get better when, when, when you know, you're not sharing it with people and, and seeking the help. Thank you, Jonathan, for joining us today. It's really been a pleasure to have you on our podcast. I want to give a huge thank you to Michael J. LeBeau for sponsoring us each month, as well as to Beverly Hills High School PTSA and Beverly Vista PTA for your ongoing support. And of course, a huge thank you to KBEV for producing our show. I hope you all tune in next month. Next month, we will be talking about how to de-stress and relax before finals and before the holidays. Have a good day, stay safe, and remember to make today well lived.